Q. That it was a titanic struggle, she said, in the cutlass, heading deeper into the secluded area, because whenever for a moment her terror bested her, or she for any reason lost her intense focus on the mulatto, even for a moment, the effect on the connection was obvious, his profile relaxing into its grin and his right eye again going empty and dead as he recrudesced and began once again to sing song psychotically about the implements in his trunk and what he had in store for her once he found the ideal secluded spot. And she could tell that in the wavering of the soul connection he was automatically reverting to resolving his connectionary conflicts in the only way he knew. And I clearly remember her saying that by this time, Whenever she succumbed and lost focus for a moment and his eye and face reverted to creepy, psychotic, unconflicted glee, she was surprised to find herself feeling no longer paralyzing terror for herself but a nearly heartbreaking sadness for him, the psychotic mulatto. And I'll say that it was at roughly this point in listening to the story, still nude in bed, that I began to admit to myself that not only was it a remarkable post-coedal anecdote but that this was, in certain ways, rather a remarkable woman, and that I felt a bit sad or wistful that I had not noticed this type of remarkability in her when I had first been attracted to her in the park. This was while the mulatto has meanwhile spotted a sight that meets his criteria and has pulled crunchingly over in the gravel by the side of the secluded area's road and asks her, somewhat apologetically or ambivalently it seems, to get out of the cutlass and to lie prone on the ground and to lace her hands behind her head in the position of both police arrests and gangland executions. A well-known position, obviously, and no doubt chosen for its associations and intended to emphasize both the ideas of punitive custody and of violent death. She does not hesitate or beg. She had long since decided that she must not give in to the temptation to beg or plead or cajole or in any way appear to resist him. She was rolling all her dice on these daffy-sounding beliefs in connection and nobility and compassion as more fundamental and primary components of soul than psychosis or evil. I note that these beliefs seem far less canned or flaccid when someone appears willing to stake their life on them. This was as he orders her to lie prone in the roadside gravel while he goes back to the trunk to browse through his collection of torture implements. She says by this time she could feel very clearly that her Aceros Focus's connective powers were being aided by spiritual resources far greater than her own, because even though she was in a prone position, and her face and eyes were in the clover or flocks in the gravel by the car, and her eyes tightly shut, she could feel the soul connection holding and even strengthening between herself and the mulatto. She could hear the conflict and disorientation in the sex offender's footsteps as he went to the cutlass's trunk. She was experiencing a whole new depth of focus. I was listening to her very intently. It wasn't suspense. Lying there helpless and connected, she says her senses had taken on the nearly unbearable acuity we associate with drugs or extreme meditative states. She could distinguish lilac and shattercane scents from flocks and lamb's quarter, the watery mint of first-growth clothes. Wearing a corbeau leotard beneath a kind of loose-waisted cotton dirndl and on one wrist a great many bracelets of pinchbeck copper. She could decoct from the smell of the gravel in her face the dank verdure. That we all had to take as an undergrad. The mystic approaches the hot dog stand and tells the vendor, make me one with everything. It wasn't the sort of distracted division where I was both listening and not. I was listening, both intellectually and emotionally. This religion survey was popular because the professor was so colorful and such a perfect stereotype example of the 60s mentality. Several times during the semester he returned to the point that distinctions between psychotic delusions and certain kinds of religious illuminations were very slight and esoteric and had used the analogy of the edge of a sharpened blade to convey the thinness of the line between the two, psychosis and revelation. And at the same time, I was also remembering a near hallucinatory detail that evening's outdoor concert and festival and the configurations of people on the grass and blankets and the parade of lesbian folk singers on the poorly amplified stage, the very configuration of the clouds overhead and the foam in Tad's cup and the smell of various conventional and non-aerosol insect repellents and Silverglades cologne and barbecued food and sunburned children 
and how when I'd first seen her seated foreshortened behind and between the legs of a vegetarian kebab vendor, she was eating a supermarket apple with a small supermarket price sticker still affixed to it, and that I'd watched her with a sort of detached amusement to see whether she would eat the price sticker without taking it off. It took him a long time to achieve release, and she held him and gazed at him lovingly the entire time. If I'd asked a U-type question such as did she really feel loving as the mulatto was raping her, or was she merely conducting herself in a loving manner, she would have gazed blankly at me and had no idea what I was talking about. I remembered weeping at movies about animals as a child, even though some of these animals were predators and hardly what you would consider sympathetic characters. On a different level, this seemed connected to the way I had first noticed her indifference to basic hygiene at the community festival and had formed judgments and conclusions based solely on that. Just as I am watching you forming judgments based on the openings of things I'm describing that then prevent you from hearing the rest of what I try to describe. It's due to her influence that this makes me sad for you instead of pissed off. And all this going on simultaneously, I felt more and more sad. I smoked my first cigarette in two years. The moonlight had moved from her to me, but I could still see her profile. A saucer-sized circle of fluid on the sheet had dried and vanished. You were the sort of auditor for whom rhetoricians designed the exordium. From below in the gravel, she subjects the psychotic mulatto to the well-known female gaze. And she describes his facial expression during the rape as the most heartbreaking thing of all. That it had been less an expression than a kind of anti-expression, empty of everything as she unpremeditatedly robbed him of the only way he'd ever found to connect. His eyes were holes in the world. She felt almost heartbroken, she said, as she realized that her focus and connection were inflicting far more pain on the psychotic than he could ever have inflicted upon her. This was how she described the division, a hole in the world. I began in the dark of our room to feel terrible sadness and fear. I felt as though there had been far more genuine emotion and connection in that anti-rape she suffered than in any of the so-called lovemaking I spent my time pursuing. Now I'm sure you know what I'm talking about now. Now we're on your terra firma. The whole prototypical male syndrome. Eric drags Sarah to tipi by hair. The well-known privileging of the subject. Don't think I can't speak your language. She finished in the dark, and it was only in memory that I saw her clearly. The well-known male gaze. Her seated pose, a proto-feminine contraposto, with one hip on a Nicaraguan blanket with a strong smell of unrefined wool to it, with her trust me on this breathtaking leg sort of curled out to the side, so her weight was on one arm stiff-armed out behind her, and the other hand held the apple. Am I describing this right? Can you? The toile skirt, hair that nearly reached the blanket, the blanket dark green with yellow filigree and a kind of nauseous purple fringe, a linen singlet and vest of false buckskin, sandals in a rattan bag, bare feet with phenomenally dirty soles, dirty beyond belief, their nails like the nails of a laborer's hands. Imagine being able to console someone as he weeps over what he's doing to you as you console him. Is that wonderful or sick? Have you ever heard of the cuvade? No perfume, the slight scent of some unrefined soap like those old cakes of deep yellow laundry soap one's aunt tried to... I realized I had never loved anyone. Isn't that trite? like a canned line. Do you see how open I'm being with you here? And who would go to the trouble of kebabbing only vegetables? I had to respect her blanket's boundary on the approach. You do not just stroll up out of the blue and ask to share someone's wool blanket. Boundaries are an important issue with this type. I assumed a sort of respectful squat just off its fringe with my weight on my knuckles so that my tie hung down straight between us like a counterweight. As we casually rapped and chatted and I deployed the pained confession of true motive tactic, I watched her face and felt as though she knew just what I was doing and why and was both amused and responsive. I could tell she felt an immediate affinity between us, an aura of connection, and it's sad to recall the way I viewed her acquiescence, the fact of her response, a little disappointed that she was so easy. Her easiness was both disappointing and refreshing. 